Hi there everyone and welcome back to National Five Biology Unit 3 Life on Earth. So today we're looking at key area 5 which is food production and what this key area really focuses on is this idea of the world population growing. So this is an article here from 1999 when the world population hit 6 billion people. If we fast forward a bit to 2011, so not a huge increase in years, the world hit 7 billion people. This is a massive increase in a relatively short space of time and all the data that we look at suggests that this is just going to keep getting bigger and bigger. So one of the problems with us having so many humans on earth is the idea of how sustainable this is and one of the key things is how are we going to feed them. So it should take just a little bit of common sense to realise that an increase in human population requires an increase in food yield. Yield is the volume of food that you grow or you harvest. So there are two ways that we can try and cope with this increase in, in crop yield and food yield. And these are pesticides and fertilisers. So pesticides are chemicals that are used to kill pests that damage crops. So pest, pesticide should be fairly easy to remember. So anything that's trying to eat your food or damage your crops in any way, you can use pesticides to kill them. The other side of this is fertilisers. So fertilisers are a substance that are added to soil in order to increase its fertility, in, in order to give it some more nutrients and basically just to increase crop yield through having better soil, better nutrients for those plants to grow. We're going to look at both of these and look at some alternative methods of increasing yield. So let's start with pesticides. So as I've said, plants and animals that can decrease your crop yield can be killed off by pesticides and they're simply sprayed on top of the crops. The only problem with this idea is if you're spraying a harmful chemical all over your crops, you will be killing off some insects or some other pests that are going to be trying to damage your crops, but also this could accumulate in the bodies of organisms over time as they're passed along a food chain. So hopefully you remember the food chain with the idea of there being a producer, so in this case, your crop, then there being a primary consumer, uh, say for example, a type of beetle that is eating your plants. You use spray pesticides on them, you will kill the beetles, but say there is a, a bird that eats these beetles. If they're eating these beetles that are full of a toxic chemical, that can then start to build up into the bird and cause issues there, for example. Uh, one example of this is DDT. So this was an insecticide that was used in the 1940s to control mosquito populations in southern Europe. You can still find it, it's quite a, a dangerous chemical and there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of studies that show the relationship between DDT and cancer now, it's quite harmful. When this was used though, DDT accumulated in food chains like I was mentioning earlier on and it caused birds of prey to have very, very weak eggshells. So if you look at this picture here, on the left is your sort of ideal eggshell. But on the right, there's an eggshell that had been laid by a bird of prey that had been ingesting organisms that had been exposed to DDT. So it caused this really soft eggshell, which then meant that far, far less birds of prey were actually successfully hatching or being born. And this caused a massive decrease in the numbers of birds of prey in southern Europe. And this was all traced back to just a pesticide that was being used on plants that got into the food system and the food chain and then caused these impacts. So if we're looking at how this can be a bad thing using pesticides, we have to look at some alternatives as well. And you can be asked to describe some of them or list some of them. The first one is something you've probably heard of before, genetic modification, so GM crops, and using that as an alternative to pesticides. If you can't really remember genetic engineering or genetic modification, please go back to the Unit 1 Cell Biology uh, unit and go to the key area of genetic engineering just to remind you of how that works by taking a gene that you want from another organism and inserting it into another. In this case, we have Australian cotton plants on the left and on the right of this picture. On the left, there are GM crops. So they are Australian cotton crops that have been inserted or had a a gene uh, that's a pesticide inserted into them which makes them resilient to insects, so a sort of inbuilt pesticide. On the right though, there's no genetic modification and as you can see, the one on the left, there's lots of cotton, the one on the right, there is not much cotton at all, there's only a few ones you can see scattered about because the insects have damaged them. 
So GM can be controversial, there's a lot of negative press about it in the media and such, but this is an example here, whereby changing the genetic structure of this plant, you can inbuild a pesticide and help increase crop yield, something that could be incredibly important to us in the future. Another alternative to this is something called biological control. So biological control is used as an alternative, a sort of natural alternative, and it's basically using the natural predators of the pest that's causing the problem to decrease the pest numbers. So for example, if you had some green fly coming around and eating all your crops, eating all your plants, you could release a bunch of ladybirds into the area. Ladybirds are a natural predator of these green fly, and therefore the ladybirds will go about, they won't attack your plants, but they will eat the pests that are causing problems. And again, reducing damage to plants and going back to increasing your crop yield. Another example of biological control though is using disease. So myxomatosis is a disease that affects rabbits and this has been spread around before in order to decrease rabbit levels because rabbits can cause a lot of damage to crops and instead of going out and manually having to find them and shoot them or trap them or anything like that, you can actually spread myxomatosis about a rabbit population which will greatly decrease their numbers and will also increase your crop yield. So something that, again, is controversial, people can get very upset about, but looking at the crop yield side of things, this is another example of biological control, so a natural alternative to using pesticides. Let's move on to fertilisers now. So fertilisers are just substances, either natural uh, or artificial, that contain extra supplies of nutrients that are required by plants. So you're giving them a boost in nutrients in order to increase their growth and increase their crop yield. So this can be done naturally through a couple of ways, either by adding compost or manure to your crops. Another way of doing this is ploughing clover into the field. So we're going to talk a bit about nutrients in a minute, but clover is very, very high in nitrogen. And what often happens is you can see a field that has been ploughed, it's been harvested, and it's just allowed to have a natural growth of clover over it over a period of time, and then the farmer can come across and plough that clover back into the field. That puts all that nitrogen back into the soil, and then you can start a new process of growing crops. The artificial method of doing this is just using something called nitrate fertilisers. So you can see in the pictures here, you have pellets, they're just uh, artificial chemicals, containing something called nitrate that can be used to boost the, the crop yield. So we're going to look at this in a minute. But first, another alternative goes back to genetic modification. So again, in this picture you can see there are two crops, or one crop really, in the picture. On the left is non-genetic modification, and on the right has been genetically modified. Crops can be genetically modified to increase their yield without the need for chemicals. Again, using this genetic modification to make sure that they're growing more or there, there's more to them. So for example, you can have a potato plant, say for argument's sake, a potato plant on average has about eight potatoes on it. You could modify that potato plant in order to produce more potatoes. So instead of eight potatoes, you get 20 potatoes. And over time, this is going to massively increase your crop yield. So again, another alternative, rather than using fertilizers, you can use genetic modification. So going back to this uh, use of nitrates and use of, uh, use of chemicals or nutrients that a plant needs. Plants need nitrogen, it's a very, very important element for them, but they have to be taken up in a very specific form. So nitrogen is taken up by plants in the form of nitrate. So you need to remember the nitrate name, it's really important. Nitrate can be dissolved in water, so it can be dissolved in soil water and absorbed through the roots of a plant. Once nitrates have been taken up, they can be used to produce amino acids, which hopefully you remember uh, are really important for protein synthesis, so they are synthesized into plant proteins. Then what happens, this plant has these proteins inside them, animals can then consume the plants or other organisms to obtain their own amino acids for protein synthesis. And this is how we're getting all this protein all coming back from nitrogen. Doesn't matter what you're eating, it all comes back to either a plant or something that's been eating a plant at some stage and the nitrogen that goes through that. So it's really important to remember that the use of fertilizers 
is to increase the nitrate content of the soil, which is nitrogen. We're also going to look very briefly at some of the problems of fertilizers. You need to add fertilizers so you can get some more nitrate into the soil, increase your crop yield, and you need that to feed the growing population. However, one of the problems you can have is something called algal bloom. So, fertilizers can leach into fresh water, and leach is basically like, um, spreading into the water, leaking into the water. And it causes what's in this picture here called an algal bloom, which is a massive, massive increase in the growth rate of algae. And this leads ultimately to a reduction in oxygen levels in that water ecosystem and has a really negative impact on that ecosystem. And we'll have a look why in a minute. So this is an example from China of a massive algal bloom in a lake which people are using. As you can see here, it's not particularly harmful to the boy that's swimming through it, but it's not particularly pleasant. And it's having a massive impact on what's underneath that water, that freshwater ecosystem that used to be working fairly well, has now been almost wiped out by algal bloom. And we're going to have a look at why that is. So this diagram really shows you what happens. First of all, if you have a farm or anything else that is using fertilizers near a water source, then if it, it, at some point there's going to be such a buildup of these fertilizers that they are going to leach into the water. It could be through streams to start off with, it could go directly into the lake, whatever it is, it will start to get into that water. When those fertilizers get into the water, the plants are going to grow a lot better, just like they would with crops. So you'd start with uh, things like algae, duckweed, any other plants in the water will grow a lot better than they normally do, which sounds like a good thing, but eventually, this algae will grow so well that it completely covers the top of the water. If that covers the top of the water, it prevents sunlight reaching the plants under the water. These plants will die, what oxygen in the water will get used up, and you will start to have a lot of bacteria, a lot of decomposers, if you remember us talk about that, breaking down these dead plants in the water. That uses up even more oxygen. Eventually, all this bacteria grows and the oxygen gets used up, and it can lead to the total death of the ecosystem. The fish will not be able to live in the water, any other aquatic life will not be able to live in the water, and it's all because the light has been blocked out because of this algal layer that has grown massively because there's been fertilizers used nearby. It's got a massive detrimental effect to the, the ecosystem, and it's being caused indirectly by fertilizers. So in this uh, little task here for you, there are five stages of algal bloom, but they are in the wrong order. And what I'd really like you to do is to pause this and to have a look at these and put them through in the right order. It's a question that could come up quite a lot. It's good for you to know the stages exactly as they happen. So if you pause this, I will go back onto the next stage just now. Okay, so hopefully you've managed to figure this out or look back in the diagram. But it starts off where fertilizers leach into the fresh water, so you get all these extra nitrates coming into the water system. Next, this increases the algal population, that causes an algal bloom, which goes and spreads over the water. This then reduces light levels by blocking out the sunlight, which kills aquatic plants. Next, bacteria feed on the dead plants and dead algae. The bacteria increase greatly in number, and that uses up huge, huge quantities of oxygen. This reduces oxygen available for all our organisms and effectively kills off the rest of the ecosystem. The ecosystem has been totally changed because of the algal bloom. So that is the end of food production. There's not a lot to it. The main thing for you to remember is fertilizers and pesticides. Have a look at what they do, what's good about them, what's bad about them, what else you can use instead of fertilizers and pesticides. And follow more with fertilizers have a look over algal bloom and how that can work. Will you want to go and do a diagram, will you want to list out the stages, whatever works for you, just try and remember those stages of algal bloom and how they happen. I've got a couple of questions here that I'll go through first of all. So this would be a past paper question you could get, which is state the term used to describe the use of a predator as an alternative to pesticides. So hopefully you can remember there are a couple of alternatives to pesticides, but the use of a predator is biological control, okay, and the other one being genetic modification. Next, it will talk about genetic engineering, say that 
Uh, genetic engineering was used to develop the beetle-resistant variety of potato plants. Before the development of genetic engineering, farmers used other methods to control the beetle numbers in potato fields. Name one of these methods. So let's talk to you about genetic engineering. What you could talk about is biological control like the uh, previous one, or you could talk about before that pesticides were used and that genetic engineering is now an alternative to pesticide use. And finally, I've got a question here on the stages of algal bloom. So it starts off by telling you that uh, the following statements show how algal bloom occurs, but it's in the incorrect order, so it's about the question I've just done previously. It gives you the first one, number three, which is overuse of fertilizers, and you need to fill in the next four boxes to have those stages. So again, if you give this a pause, I will go through it, and we can discuss the order of them. Okay, so obviously the overuse of fertilizers, number three, is the first one. Second, we move on to number one, which is chemicals leach into the water. Next would be five, which is when the algal bloom develops. After that, the oxygen levels decrease, so number four. And then at the end, fish die, or other organisms die, number two. So as you can see, there's not a lot to this key area. It's worth just going over and I'm making a quizzes at the moment that I'll include with this video. But just look over fertilizers, pesticides, and algal bloom. Remember that nitrogen is taken up in the form of nitrate, and remember the sequence of amino acids and proteins. I'll get to work on uploading the final key area for unit three as well, and then that will be you almost done this unit. Okay, thanks so much for listening, folks. Speak to you again soon.